it's so good to see you. It has been forever since we got to I know. host on here. Actually, uh, I think it was one other time that we were together hosting. So I think this is great. The, it's like a family reunion. Uh, I love oh that. Goodness. Hey, speaking of that, starting next week, we have exciting news. Yes, we're actually all going to be together, right? Talk about a big family reunion. What are the details on that? Oh, man. So starting on February 27th, we are going to have one online worship experience, and it's going to be at 10 a.m. Should I say Eastern? Yes, time? you should definitely say Eastern, because I've got some statistics just from the past month where people are chiming in from. We know Raleigh, Wake Forest, Cary, Charlotte, Greensboro, the state of North Carolina. Well, get this. Let's zoom on out to the United States. We got North Carolina. Go on over to New York. Between there, all the states, we got Indiana, we got California, Florida. People are coming in. Zoom all the way out to the globe, and we got six countries just in the past month. So we definitely need to be clear about the time. February 27th. 10 a.m. Eastern, Eastern time. time in the U.S. Hey, and if you're worshiping with us for the first time today, we want to invite you to something we call Try Five. We hope you'll join us over the next five weeks. And as an incentive, when you finish Try Five, we'll donate $25 to one of our community partners on your behalf. So just by trying five, you'll be on the mission mm -hmm. to help us impact the community. So be sure and let us know each week as you continue through that Try Five challenge. You can put that on your Connect card. Card. Now, speaking of the Connect mm -hmm. Card, we love the Connect Cards. We yes, love for we everyone worshiping with us this morning to fill out a Connect Card. You can find it in the Life Points app. And if you don't have that yet, there'll be a QR code somewhere on this screen. And you can scan that with your phone and do it that way. Uh, you can also find out all of the things about Life Point. Mm -hmm. You can ask for info on groups. You can do prayer requests. So fill out that Connect Card. Yes. Well, every week we talk about worshiping through generosity. Here's something really cool that I've seen. Cindy, as I've reached out, whether it's a phone or an email, actually happened to discover LifePoint this past month. People hold up their, their card, Devoted 22 card, and their keychain, and they say, we've got it, and you know what? We're all about a deeper devotion to Christ, His church, and His mission. They're keeping it before them. And here's what's neat about that. You say, okay, how's that connect with generosity? Well, these things don't just get printed for free or somehow the Devoted 22 keychain arrives at the church. It's your generosity that helps us put things like this before the church family and they're staying focused on Jesus Christ. So thank you for your generosity week in and week out. You can give a gift today by going to our website. Again, thanks for your generosity. It's having an impact on the church accomplishing its mission.
am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say Thanks for joining us today. We're going through a significant book in the New Testament called Romans. This is week six, and I'm loving this series. I'm enjoying the process of researching and writing, and I enjoy the feedback that you're giving. And I can confidently say that in all my years of standing in front of people and teaching, I've never received this much feedback. So keep listening, keep reading, keep reading on your own, keep taking notes, and you will continue to see how powerful God's word is in your life. You know, over the last six weeks, we've talked about a lot. We've talked about the gospel, sin, grace, immoral sex, moral sex, and judgment. Now, judgment is what Paul's talking about a lot in chapter two and chapter three, and it's gonna require a couple of weeks because just like now, people at the church in Rome struggled with comparing themselves to others, and so Paul spends a significant amount of time talking about judgment. See, when we judge others or compare ourselves to others, we can't win. When you compare yourself to somebody else, here's what happens. You either think too highly of yourself, well, I'm so much better than them, which causes you to miss your weak spots, or you think too little of yourself. I could never be as good as that person. And then you'll miss that you're not supposed to be like anyone else. You're supposed to be like the person God created. What was happening in Rome was the Jewish Christians, the religious people, looked down on these new Gentile Christians. And they were judging them and feeling too good about themselves. A couple things that we need to remember. When Paul says, who are you to judge? It's because they're judging hypocritically. He's echoing the words of Jesus when Jesus set the standard in Matthew chapter seven, verse five, when he said, you hypocrite. He was talking about people who are judging. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. See, he told them how to judge, which was starting with self, with your own heart. Now, that's a struggle for all of us because we want to be judged based on our best day, but we tend to judge others based on their worst. Now, of course, we have to judge right and wrong, or we could never help those in need. 
We could never warn people in trouble. Uh, we couldn't even lead our families well if we couldn't make a judgment between right and wrong. Jesus and Paul talked about what they're doing and they're making hypocritical judgments. That's what we need to avoid. Judging others for doing the same things that we do. That's what Paul's talking about. So if you watched last week, I gave you the challenge to write 10 positive reviews. And I noticed many of you wrote some great reviews for our church and we really appreciate that. You know, as I wrote my positive reviews, I was thinking to myself, you know, saying kind things about people or organizations or services, it just makes me feel better. And I'm sure you felt the same thing. So if you haven't done that yet, get online today, write some positive reviews and you'll feel better. So Paul continues talking to these Jewish Christians who were busy judging the Gentile Christians without first looking at their own hearts. And they had two problems. They were looking down on others because they thought God favored them over others, over the Gentiles. And Paul reminds them in chapter two, verse 11, when he ends up that section saying, for God does not show favoritism, to let them know that they weren't being judged by a different standard than everybody else because God doesn't show favoritism. Here's something you can be confident of. If walls are being built up, if people are being put in categories and pitted against each other, it is not from God and it never will be. Culture now, like culture then, builds up walls, assigns labels, and divides. And God tears all of that down. God does not show favoritism and neither should we. Now, the reason the Jewish Christians were judging their Gentile brothers and sisters was because in their minds, because one, because of their upbringing, but in their minds, they were part of God's chosen nation, the ones whom he had given the law, the Mosaic law. And the only way to get close to God was to become more like them because they had the law. Adopt their laws and their restrictions and you too could follow Christ. That's what they believed. And so they had their categories that they'd built up. And all that Paul is teaching is trying to encourage them and, and convict them to tear those categories down and see that we are all one in Christ. See, Jewish Christians who had the law, which means the Old Testament law, and Gentiles, they put themselves in these two categories. So their question was this, if Gentiles don't have the law, then how can they be saved? And Paul explained there's a big difference between hearing the law and obeying the law. It's the same thing for us. There's a big difference between hearing God's word, which is easy for us to do because we all have it in our pockets, and obeying God's word. So Paul starts out in chapter two, beginning at verse 12, and says this, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law and are declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, their thoughts and sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. Paul is telling them, hey, Jewish Christians, you think you're okay because you hear and understand. You think you're being made right by God because uh, you know something. And he's trying to let them know being made right with God comes through obedience, not knowledge. See, the law had become this outward physical thing to the Jewish nation and to the Jewish Christians. They believed it as Jews, and then when they accepted Christ, they continued to believe that the law and their ability to obey it is what saved them. And it had become this outward and physical thing to them. That's the same thing religion can do to us. If you've ever been stuck in a religious environment, see, we come to church, we read our Bible, and we think we're good. But Jesus doesn't ask for some of our life or little parts of our life. Jesus wants all of our life. Nowhere in the Bible is that made more clear than in Matthew chapter 19, when a young man came up to Jesus and he asked him a question. He said, teacher, 
What do I need to do to get eternal life? And here's what happened. Turn with me to Matthew 19, beginning at verse 17. Jesus said this, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbors yourself. All these I've kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. This rich man found out that following laws doesn't change hearts. He had followed all the laws. He was a really good guy, but he had one thing that was between him and his full obedience to God. In this case, it was his money and his lack of generosity. So he had a decision to make, just like we do. Do I turn everything over to Jesus and obey him, or do I continue to go my own way? And in verse 22, we see what the man decided when he said this. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. See, Jesus says, obey me, and he chooses not to. Even though he was nice, he would have been a church-going uh, young boy. He would have been religious. And so those are the people who were judging the Gentiles, the ones that had it all fixed up, at least it looked like they did on the outside, but they were not giving Jesus their hearts in full obedience to him. So understand this, there is a difference between hearing God's word and obeying God's word. One group heard, the other group used their conscience. Jewish Christians have the law. The Gentile Christians didn't have the law, but they had what Paul refers to as their conscience, the, the, using that to determine what was right and wrong. We all do that. It's that little voice inside of us that says, you shouldn't do that. That's a bad investment. You should say no. If you do this, you're gonna regret it. When I was a teenager, my brother, who's 11 years older than me, uh, he heard that I was doing some stuff I shouldn't do. And I was uh, probably around 15 or 16. He heard that I'd uh, been experimenting with drinking a little bit. And so he took me to lunch one day and he said, are you drinking alcohol? And I said, yes, I am. And then he said, are you doing drugs? I said, no, I'm not doing drugs, but I am around people who do. He then said, listen, don't you ever do drugs. You could take, snort, or smoke something bad that has something in it that shouldn't be there. You will die and go straight to hell and burn for all eternity. And I was like, okay, you convinced me. No drugs, note to self, no drugs. Don't wanna die, go to hell and burn for all eternity. But that little bit of advice that I laugh with my brother about now served as my conscience every time I got in an environment I shouldn't have been in and I was tempted to do what I knew wasn't good for me and I never gave in to that because I could remember my brother saying, you will die and go straight to hell and burn for an eternity if this is bad and you die from it. I would think about it and I would say, no thanks. My conscience, like the Gentiles' consciences, kept me safe, at least from that. Now, following all the rules doesn't save you. Your conscience, while it might keep you from doing stupid things, sometimes it won't save you. Everyone then and everyone now are saved because they believe in and they obey Jesus Christ and give their hearts and lives to him, everything to him. See, the religious people thought that their knowledge of the Mosaic law that they possessed made them right with God, and it did not. See, when we teach the Bible, when we open this up and teach it like we've been doing over the last several weeks, I want you to learn it. I want you to memorize it. I want you to be able to use the words you learn and defend what's true with what you know. I want you to be able to see it for what it really is, God's supernatural word for all time for us. But don't just fill your head with it. Don't just learn how to win arguments with it and prove your point. Let God's word through the power of his Holy Spirit change your heart. See, all the knowledge we gain won't be beneficial unless we change our hearts, unless we love our neighbors unless we're kind and patient with them, just like Paul says that God is with all of us. See, he continues to get on them and, and let them have it over their hypocritical judgment of the Gentiles. L listen to what he says in verse 17. Now you call yourself a Jew 
If you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is, is superior because you're instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor for the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you not steal? You who say people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blaspheme among the Gentiles because of you. Now that's a long section of Paul trying to help them feel the tension between what they believed to be true and also how they were living and treating other people. He's saying, you say you have this law and you feel like it makes you better than others, but you break it. And because of that, these Gentiles that you think you're better than, they end up making fun of God. You tell others not to do it and you go out and do the same thing. You tell others not to behave a certain way and you go out and do the same thing. That is the hypocritical judgment Paul started this chapter talking about several verses ago. Now that should be a convicting verse to all who follow Christ and lead to this question. Do I bring honor or shame in the name of Christ? See, the Jewish Christians at Rome, they were dishonoring the name of God among the Gentiles. And Christians who never give their hearts fully to Christ, who choose to live in ways that don't bring honor to Christ, they're dishonoring him by their actions and attitudes. When I was a college student, I remember uh, our college pastor asking this question. Can the people around you tell that you're a follower of Jesus by the way you talk, act, and treat others? Now that was a convicting thought way back then, and it is now. Do the people around you, do they know that you follow Christ when they hear how you talk, see what you post, see what you follow, and watch the way you treat others? I know what you're thinking. Can we go back into chapter one and talk about everybody else's sins? Then Paul switches to a different topic. And this topic today doesn't mean the same to us. It makes us think different things. But Paul is gonna use an outward sign that they would have known really well. The outward sign of circumcision that was required for the Jewish nation to show that they were part of the lineage of Abraham. So in Romans chapter two, beginning at verse 25, Paul talks about something they would have well understood. He says, circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you become as though you have not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically the Gentiles, and yet obeys the law, will condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, you're a lawbreaker. Again, he's getting on them for comparing themselves to the Gentiles and walking away feeling like, hey, we're way better off than they are. He brings this up because they could have easily objected and said, hey, we're descendants of Abraham, and that is proven by the fact that we are circumcised. The Jew believed that his circumcision guaranteed his salvation. And in Paul's day, there were rabbis who taught that Abraham literally sat at the entrance of hell and made sure none of his descendants went in there. Other rabbis also taught that Jews would be judged one way and Gentiles would be judged another. So you can see why Jewish Christians had a problem with judging others. They had always been taught that they were better than everybody else. They had always been taught that they were gonna be judged differently than everybody else. And then Jesus comes along and then Paul teaching what Jesus taught that everybody's one in Christ, it was a little hard and it took a while for them to get it into their heads that all are one in Christ, that you're no better or judged no differently because you're a Jew and been one your whole life and now you've accepted Christ or you a Gentile yesterday and accepted Christ. When you're in Christ, you are all one. Here's what he was trying to get across to them. Your heritage, your good behavior, your attendance, your knowledge, that's not what makes you right with God. It's what's going on in here, in the heart. And he goes on in chapter two, verse 28, and says this. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. 
And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. He says that to prove from the very beginning, even before Jesus showed up on the scene, God has always been after our hearts. The Jews and the Gentiles, God always wanted their hearts fully committed to him. And that's what he wants from us. See, it was so easy for them to judge the Gentiles because they did their sin out in the open. You could see it. The Jewish Christians were doing the same thing. They were just hiding it. And God is saying there is no difference. I want the hearts of both. Of course, today, there, there is no sign on our bodies that shows what takes place in the heart. We have a different symbol today. It's baptism. Every time you see someone baptized, lowered into the water, immersed under the water, and raised up, they're showing on the outside what God is doing in their hearts. Later in Romans 6, and we'll learn in detail about baptism then, Paul compares our baptisms to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He compares Christ's new life with your new life because that's a picture of what happens when we come to Jesus. We die, we leave an old life behind, and we're reborn, a new life, a new person, forgiven and set free for a life with God in Jesus Christ. Now to us, it would sound more like a person is a Christian who is one inwardly, and the change takes place by the Holy Spirit ruling in a person's life, not just doing all the right things, not knowing all the right things, but allowing what we know to be true to move into our hearts. And if you feel like you're learning truth from the book of Romans, one, it's because it is truth, and two, it's because truth leads us to the understanding that Christ saves all of us the same way. We come to him in our sin, in our mistakes, desperately in need of salvation. And when we obey him, when we give him our lives, the truth of the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us and empower us to do things we could never do on our own. You know, the church in Rome was, was planted because people were filled with the Holy Spirit that we read about in Acts chapter one and two. And they went back to Rome and most likely planted that church. All of that came about because the Holy Spirit empowered them to do it. Now, if you're watching today and you have yet to say yes to Jesus, you don't have to have your act together. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to fix things up and then come to Jesus because he takes us right where we are and he loves us too much to leave us there. He changes us. He gives us a new life. He gives us the power to say no to the things that harm us and yes to the things that fully, completely surrender our lives to him. If you wanna know more about that, you can just join us in the chat. If you're watching at a playback time, you can contact us and we would love to guide you through that decision of becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. See, we don't have to look and judge others. We first look in ourselves and the Holy Spirit will let us know what's right what's wrong, and how to best follow Jesus all the days of our life. Let's pray. God, thank you for this convicting teaching from Paul. As he continues to talk about judgment and what judgment is, Father, I pray that those of us who are in your church, who are following you, may we live daily knowing that you ask for all of our lives all of our passions, all of our love, all of our commitments, God. And may you give us the strength to do that. And God, I pray for the people today watching that have yet to fully surrender their lives to you. And I pray that something as simple as a prayer request or a question in the chat will help them take that step. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
So that's next week, Rob. I'm so excited about it. Hey, and if you want more information, just go to lifepointchurch.com slash Alisa Childers. That's right. And don't forget, next week is the 10 a.m. Everybody together. We look forward to seeing you next week and have a great week. 